Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome Ian to our panel. Ian is a member of the firm's non-contentious construction team. He's got over 20 years of experience both as a solicitor in private practice and in-house with one of the UK's 10 main contractors. And he's advised on some landmark building projects as well as some major infrastructure projects. Uh, we're also welcome Marcus today. Marcus is a construction and engineering disputes lawyer um, and he's got a number of years experience in resolving disputes concerning office, retail and leisure developments, as well as doing a little bit of work on social housing projects as well. And Marcus also has some international experience. Now, I appreciate that you may um, struggle to find a common theme between the two topics that we've decided to discuss today, that of impact of inflation and supply chain disruption risk and dealing with defects. And what, what, what I really wanted to say was that there is a common thread and that these issues that we're discussing have historically been and they do continue to be common themes in building projects. Um, and whilst these issues are not new themselves, they do present different challenges against a backdrop of fast changing and ever more complex economic, social and political landscape. Um, I'm going to unashamedly steal a quote from a presentation that I attended a week or two ago. It's a quote from a late 17th century poet and he's called John Gay. Um, what he said was, um, I know you lawyers can with ease twist words and meanings as you please. That language by your skill made client will bend to favour every client. Now, I think the challenge today really is to see if Ian and Marcus in discussing each of these topics can show us with a consideration of the issues um, in question and also some clever drafting, whether it is indeed possible to twist words and meaning to favour every client. Um, I think if that's too big a ask, at the very least, Ian, as a non-contentious specialist, can help you not to fall into some of the most common fair traps. And with any luck, Marcus, as a contentious specialist, can rescue you if you do. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to Ian first, and we're going to discuss inflation and supply chain risk. So Ian, you've chosen to discuss a, what, what is a very hot topic, really, for the construction industry at the moment. Um, but why have the current rise in prices and delays in delivery of goods become such an a huge issue really for the construction industry? Well, it's a good question really, Chrissy, because if you look at the historical background, nobody would be have been interested in talking about inflationary risk or supply chain disruption mm. in the period from probably 1990 until about 2016, because it was a, bit, it was a very benign environment. Frankly, there, these issues just didn't arise. Mm. But since 2016 and the Brexit referendum, you're starting to see these supply side shocks coming through. Uh, particularly, you've got Brexit, so there were delays at the borders there as a consequence of that, uh, the friction there. Then with COVID-19, once again, you've got supply side risk issues and also you can't simply source goods and materials, so that puts pressure on prices. And subsequent to that, we've also now had the war in Ukraine, or we haven't, the ongoing war in Ukraine. So there are three huge supply side shocks that have happened there. And what I mean by supply side shocks from the construction industry's point of view is all of these things potentially extend the time period in which it takes to deliver the project and get to completion. And it also increases the cost of the project um, because prices that you estimated a year before you commenced on site are just no longer a reflection of what's there in, in the marketplace at the moment. The Bank of England at the moment is estimating that we're talking about a, an inflation rate of between peaking at between 10 and 13 percent. Mm. But if you look at the RICS surveys, if you look at the, the guidance from the Construction Industry Council at the moment, they're talking about an underlying inflation rate for construction of about 28 percent. Um, and that's that's mm. where we are at the moment. And that doesn't take into account spikes in pricing as well, which can be 100% for steel, 100% for timber. I mean, they go up and down very quickly, but you're still going to deal with that environment. So effectively, what we're looking at really is a, a resurfacing of a set of risks, which yeah. the construction industry hasn't actually had to consider in recent years. Yeah. Um, but why are these risks more of a concern for the construction industry than for any other industry? Or are we looking at a situation really where contractors are just belly aching? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very popular narrative to say we've got a belly aching contractor. They're moaning about all the risks that they've got to deal with how much of it is really valid and how much of it is just smoke and mirrors to push the mm. price up. So I fully understand that, but I do think that they have got a legitimate concern to raise at the moment. I mean, if you step back a little bit and think about what construction is, is okay, it's a product, but it's a you're developing a bespoke product. It's not a manufacturing supply line 
or an aeroplane uh, or, or a car or something along those lines. When you commission a, a building project, often, it's, as I say, bespoke, it will contain innovative uh, materials and products. It will not have the same supply chain as the previous product. So the contractor, the subcontractors will change every time. There's a, and the, the period over which the works are undertaken can be a number of years. Mm. So all of these supply side shocks that I was talking about need to be set against this background where you've got a lot of variables that you don't have when you're manufacturing another product, say an aeroplane. Mm, very convincing, Ian, but surely if the construction industry are particularly vulnerable to these kinds of risks, can't contractors just simply negotiate and draft contracts and you can help them to do that, which transfer risk to their customers, to the employer, to the developer? Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in a fairy tale landscape, that might be achievable, mm. but let's go back to what I said previously. Nothing has really changed in the last 30 years until Brexit on these two major risk issues. Um, everything has been very benign. Against that benign background, you've got an allocation of risk in building contracts that places inflationary risk, increases in prices of cost of materials, et cetera, all with the contractor. And just to illustrate the point, the conversation that we're having today is very much not about in infrastructure projects. We're talking about UK-based building projects. So building projects for apartment blocks, building, uh, sorry, uh, also yes. office, yeah, offices, that kind of thing. Straightforward building yeah. projects. Yeah, straightforward building yeah. projects. And those contracts are normally let, 75% in the UK statistically, are let on JCT design and build contracts. Of the remaining 25%, the vast bulk of those are let on JCT standard form building contracts. And those building contracts allocate these risks all to the contractor. So they agree the lump sum price, and the contractor takes the risk of any tax increases, the contractor takes the risk of any increases in products or material costs over the lifetime of the delivery of the works. I can see the problem. Um, perhaps uh, for everyone's benefit, can you give us some illustrations using this supply side shock issue that we've been talking about, where a contractor may or is likely to suffer as a consequence of JCT risk allocation? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go into a broad uh, summary of, the, of what the construction contract does. I mean, it affects payment terms, it affects uh, health and safety, it affects a number of issues. But one of the key points about a construction contract is it allocates risk. Now, we've already said that it doesn't really deal very well with inflationary risk or the increase in cost of materials, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it does allocate some risk. And there are provisions in the JCT uh, contract for additional time, they're called relevant events. You'll find them around clause two, spot 26. You'll get a, a additional money as well for relevant matters. And you can also get uh, additional time and money if there's a change in the law. Mm -hmm. And why I've brought onto this the subject of risk allocation here, is if you're talking about change of law, think about the Brexit shock that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So you had a situation there where there was a Brexit referendum, then there was the Act of Parliament for the UK leaving the EU, et cetera. That was a change in law. But then you look at the mechanism within the JCT contract, which allows for uh, uh, a, change, uh, a change in the law mm -hmm. uh, for additional time and money but it's only if it materially affects or alters the works. Now, just by us withdrawing the, the EU Withdrawal Act doesn't actually materially adversely affect the works. So there wasn't automatically an entitlement for time and money there. So that's how it doesn't work. And the same position applies with COVID-19 potentially as well, yeah. because you'd be entitled to additional time for uh, a force majeure event. Mm -hmm. But the contract's not great. JCT doesn't define force majeure events. I recall when I was working in-house for a contractor that you had a situation where you were waiting with Boris Johnson standing outside number 10 Downing Street, uh, very proud of himself, saying that we're keeping Britain working, etc. When what the contractor wanted to happen was for them to issue an instruction saying that to close the site, because that would create a relevant event which would give them additional time for their project. Yeah. That didn't happen. So it doesn't, it's not tailored to the risks. Mm. JCT as it stands is not tailored to the risks that we're talking about mm. here. I mean, from what you're saying, obviously the contractor's concerns are very real, but we've also got to appreciate that um, from a developer's 
perspective, from employers' perspective, quite understandably, they need some degree of price certainty. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like there is a bit of an impasse really between building and we've still got building projects and starting and continuing to yeah. to to run. So how are these problems actually being resolved in practice? Yeah, I mean if I look out that window though, you've got cranes yeah. going up all the time. I mean you can't just simply say we are not going to build anything, we are not going to commission works until all of these supply side shocks and inflation ring risks have gone away. So you are seeing strategies to deal with it. And some of them are borderline funny and some of them are fairly horrific, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, just to give you an idea, what I see most of the time is you've got the kicking the can down the street strategy, mm -hmm. which I'll go into in a minute. You've got this kind of inflexible strategy, rigid strategy on the part of the person commissioning, the, the entity commissioning mm -hmm. the works, the employer saying, no, JCT is what we've stuck to for all of these years. That's the way it allocates the risk. We're not budging. Um, then you've got the slightly more enlightened approach to dealing with it, which is an acknowledgement that Brexit has been a risk, that COVID has been a risk. So you will get a schedule of amendments to the JCT contract mm -hmm. that will create allowances for time and money to be granted to the contractor, but that will very much depend upon the specifics of the Brexit risk. You need to tease out what exactly creates the entitlement. So that's sort of the bolt on. Yeah, it's a bolt on. Yeah. It, that is exactly what it yeah. is. And, and, and to a certain extent, it's great, but it's retrospective. Mm. It doesn't look forward as to what's yeah. coming down the line in the future. Mm. <clears throat> and the last approach is the kind of approach where the employer has early engagement with the contractor. Um, and understands the risks fully and then works out how they're going to manage those risks. And some of it might be practical management and some of it might be legal allocation of the risks to those most able to manage them. Mm. I don't think you have to be a construction expert to um, have an idea, but what, which, which do you consider the best approach? Um, probably all know, but... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I didn't leave much the imagination there as to where I was going with this. Obviously, um, the collaborative approach, the early engagement approach to dealing with these risks is, is the one that I would favour. And it's not just the one that I would favour, it's, it's a CIC, Construction Industry Council, recommendation for the industry to follow that approach. Mm. I mean, the horrific approach that I was talking about earlier, the one that bothers me most, is the kick the can down the street approach. Mm. And what I mean by that is, and I've seen it, everything is agreed on a construction project. So building contracts agreed, the terms are agreed, the schedule of amendments agreed, the employer's uh, requirements are agreed, the contractor's proposals are agreed, it's all done mm. apart from the price. And then there's this dance going on between the contractor and the employer. And nobody will agree the price because nobody knows what the price for the works, for the materials mm. is going to be in month 12 of the programme. Mm. So what happens is that you start on site under a letter of intent, uh, where the parties Continually, the works continue and continue and continue. And but mission creep springs to mind. Exactly. That yeah. is, thank you. That is exactly the words we're, yeah. I'm looking for, mission creep. Yeah. What happens there is that you get so far into the transaction and the contractor's on site, but you haven't got price certainty. The, the employer hasn't got price certainty, mm -hmm. but they are to a certain extent the hostage of the contractor then because you're not going to stand around the contractor and say, stop that seat halfway through the project. Mm. So you end up paying a lot more than you would have done by, by kicking that can down yeah. the street. So that, that's the worst case scenario. Strangely enough, the inflexible kind of rigid approach from employers is not necessarily pro 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 problematic. Um, and what, why it's not problematic is if you've got a fairly straightforward building project, for example, what we call sheds, which are out of town shopping centres where you've got your B and Q shed, you've got toys your, off, your toys are off, that kind of thing. thing. Yeah. They're fairly straightforward in terms of building. Mm. So you haven't got long supply chains because if you're talking about concrete steel, et cetera, you can source it all in the UK. Yeah. You're not worried about things coming from China, et cetera. And you could probably plot, plot on a graph where the prices of those materials and goods are going to go to. So to turn around and say, we're sticking with the risk profile as, as we've got it, is perfectly reasonable. Mm. Uh, the responses that you get back from the contractor, you choose the one that suits you most uh, in terms of the best price and whether it's the best contractor to do the job. Mm. But it might make sense there. But if you've got that rigid approach um, and you've got a very bespoke uh, construction project, for example, a high-end hotel development in Mayfair or something mm. along those lines, 
you've got all of those moving parts, all of those different products that I was talking about. If you say we're taking none of the risk, the risk profile is as it is under the JCT agreement. The problem that you've got there is that all of your tender responses that come back from the contractors are going to price in that risk yeah. and you could potentially pay more than you need to. Yeah, oh, I just did want to go back though. The, the, the other concern that you've got on this inflexible approach is that you pass all the risks to the contractor, they underprice it, they get the job on site. And you sink your but, contractor. Yeah, and you sink your contractor mm -hmm. because it is worthwhile thinking about this. The profit margins in a competitive mar market for contractors are two and three percent. Yeah. So it wouldn't take much in terms of supply chain side shocks or inflationary risk, prices increasing where their profit's gone. Yeah. And they're diving. Yeah, yeah. And the idea of getting another contractor on afterwards to fix the problem, they are going to price that high. Yeah. So you will pay. You yeah. will pay for that strategy. Um. So this early engagement collaborative approach is obviously the, the favoured approach. Yeah. Um. Can you would you like talk talk to us a little bit more about how you've seen that work in practice? Um. Yeah. I mean. The first thing I'd say about it, and the most obvious way of dealing. With, dealing with the collaborative approach is a tender stage looking at if the first thing I think is getting the right contractor a tender stage mm -hmm. and what tender process you follow because if you have got long supply chains and you have got a list of products that you don't think it might be difficult to source you want to be looking at your contractor and knowing that they are established in the marketplace that they have that supply chain security mm -hmm. which would reduce the risk in the first place the next point about early engagement is that you perhaps want to do a two-stage tender process yeah. where you've got a professional services agreement between you and your selected contractor to work out the design on the project and also to work out the pricing. And that is a discussion process there because you might select something particularly bespoke, uh, bespoke or sparkly, you know, Willy Wonka's glass lift or something like that in the atrium of your posh hotel. But it might be just too risky. They might turn around and say, well, if you want that, but you're, the supply you're proposing is in China. Yeah. They lock down every five minutes for COVID at the moment. You might want to think about doing something else. So that's that kind of collaborative approach. And it's also the approach that builds up an understanding of where you get to the price. Yeah. And then you can move on after that and enter into the main building contract. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of collaborative, two-stage tender, uh, professional service contract approach. I think that that is where a good way to go. Yeah, and have you got an example of in practice, what of, you know, project where you've actually seen it work, where it's been an effective tool, really? Yeah, I mean, the most obvious one was when I was actually in house for a contractor, and the contractor was speaking uh, to the employer in this case, and it was a large central London uh, apartment block. Mm. And as is popular at the moment, you've got prefabricated units that are slotted into these apartment blocks. So you had a pre-built bathroom that you would slot in and they would all be loaded on a ship from China uh, and sent over to the UK and then put into the building. The conversation there was, this is a long leading item. It's going to be manufactured on site. How do we deal with this? We don't want delays, etc. Order it early. Yeah. Order it early, okay, fine, how do we deal with that? Well, we put it in as a listed item in the building contract, which allows the contractor to get paid early for the for these prefabricated units when they're not brought to site, because mm -hmm. normally you only get paid for, for goods and materials as they get brought yeah. to site. Um, and there was a conversation there about basically making sure that the order early was okay, but also the employer was protected in that process. So there was a uh, vesting certificate, there was an off-site materials bond to, to support and protect the, the employer just in case that manufacturer in China got, became insolvent. Yeah. So the cosy chat. I mean, we're yeah. not living in a fairy tale here. No. Um, and I don't think really really I'm, I'm not going to let you get away with that that easily. Yeah. And the solution can't just simply be a cosy chat between the partners. In fact, to discuss the risks, how best to deal with them. Yeah. And fundamentally, that doesn't change the contractual risk profile that we've discussed um, yeah. earlier. What are you seeing in practice? Um, what are the mechanical tools, really, in terms of um, con the contracts themselves that um, we're seeing amendments or yeah. uh, ways to deal with, yeah. with, with this risk? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the cosy chat is a nice way of saying the two-stage dinner process to sit yeah. down. 
And that's the concept. The cozy chat is about the risk. Then you move on to how you deal with that risk. Mm -hmm. Once you've decided that it's a real risk and not perhaps contract a bellyache yeah. because you've explored the risk uh, for a particular product, for particular materials, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there are various mechanisms within the JCT contract that can help the parties reallocate these risks more practically. Mm -hmm. As I said, you might not need a legal reallocation at all. You can just change the product or change, change the source of the product during the discussion. But in addition, there are issues like listed items where you can pay for the goods in advance, so they're ordered in advance. Mm -hmm. That's dealt with at contract particulars. If you look at clause 415, 415, yeah. 4, something along the lines there, you can elect to list items that you can then pay for early, yeah. but subject to those protections. Mm -hmm. You've also got provisional sums. So if you don't know how much at the moment a particular item is going to cost, you can put that item into the contract as a provisional sum. And then the employer can elect whether to instruct the use of that provisional sum, i.e. acquire that product or not, depending upon when it's needed, for perhaps in six months' time after the works mm -hmm. have commenced. So it's kind of, it, it, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all on the provisional sums issue, because you can't turn around and say all steel, all concrete is a provisional sum. Yeah. But if you've got selected items that you might not know what the price is going to be, you can deal with it like that. Um, then there are these fluctuation clauses, which is pretty much get your flares out because nobody's looked at them since the 1970s. Uh, and the drafting actually refers to some kind of things that are very kind of in place in the 1970s that don't apply now. But by fluctuation clauses, I mean clauses in a contract that allow the contractor additional time and money mm. for certain events. Now, that can be increases in taxes, increases in cost of materials, now, the, the JCT has standard form fluctuation clauses as it has a standard form contract and you can elect or not elect uh, to adopt those. In the past, the standard position in the JCT contract particulars is the option A, I'll go into this in a second, mm. applies unless you strike it out. And everybody has just religiously struck that out for the last 20, 30 years. That's not the case now. But you've got those standard form fluctuation mm. clauses, which we'll go into. But you can also have a conversation following that two-stage end of process, that cozy chat, and perhaps have a bespoke clause drafted by your lawyer in the schedule of amendments to the JCT that will deal with the specific products or items and perhaps share the risk. Mm. So if they go up by 10%, you share half of the cost of that year. Or, or, or decrease. Mm. That, I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to sound too pro contractor here because basically all of this advice that I'm giving now is making sure your product gets over the line for roughly the price you thought it was going to and that there are no shocks. Yeah. So you can get those bespoke clauses in there as well. No, I didn't, You're know, going to, yeah, yeah, I didn't I know, know whether you wanted to talk about fluctuation. No, I don't want to talk I about know, fluctuation. I know, I think you clauses. did, but now that you have and everyone's yeah. dusting off their schedules yeah. to their JCT contract and wondering what actually. They say, yeah. um, I, th I think um, a lot of people be aware of the fact that we've got three fluctuation options in the JCT yeah. seven contract, mm -hmm. option A, option B, option C. Now, if you didn't want to talk about fluctuation clauses in the first place, I know that you're not going to want to talk about option C, but mm -hmm. perhaps just give us a brief overview of, of the three options and, and when we'd be looking to use them. Really. Okay, right. So as I said, in the JCT contract particulars, you can elect which fluctuation clause you want. If you don't strike them all out, you end up with option A. And just going to option A, option A is a fluctuation clause that only really relates to taxes and levies. And their taxes and levies on materials and goods and, uh, and taxes and levies on employment. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about there is, now this is a uh, example, supply side shock again, Brexit. Mm -hmm. I mean, the government changes every five minutes at the moment. Um, and somebody upsets the Northern Ireland Protocol, we're suddenly in a trade war with the EU, we're back to WTO terms, yeah. then if you've got a fluctuation clause A in there, you'll be able to look at that and go, well, this was the price and the tax that's paid on this material or good coming in from the EU at the time, now there's 20% dumped on top. Mm. So you would then do an assessment on your payment application to reflect that fact. But I would emphasise on option A, like the other options, it also works the other way. So if things fall, the price will come down and the contractor's got to make the adjustment mm -hmm. and make the payment application on that basis yeah. as well. And it doesn't include profit. So yeah. if prices go up 
and you get additional money for those increased costs, that's fine, but you don't get additional profit. You're not rewarding the contractor for increases in the cost in the marketplace. Mm. We're not talking about BP or Shell's profit margin. Yeah. You don't get a reward. Yeah. I mean, optionally useful, but fairly limited. I yeah, useful, but fair, limited. Fair, option, yeah. B, option B, option B, option B is the one that if you were a contractor that you would want, uh, if you were an employer, you would handle with care and perhaps think about the spoke fluctuation clause, mm. the specific risks, because it's much broader option B. Option B covers increases in taxes, but it also increases increases in materials costs. Yeah. So you would put your tender prices in there that you price the job on for particular materials, goods, et cetera. Then there, you would look at the price of those materials as paid for. Uh, you would make an adjustment on the payment application and recover that. Once again, works both ways. So if, and we say, we're being told that these costs are supposed to peak and then drop. So perhaps if you uh, enter into a building contract in, uh, in month six of 2023, you might find out that those materials costs, are, in, in an ideal world, yeah. you might find out that those materials costs are less six months later. And that will be reflected in the payment applications for those goods mm. at the time. So I think that covers that off, really. Yeah. Um, you've, you've neglected option C. Yeah, I don't, want to, about, I don't want to talk about option C. I'm going to tell all the viewers here now that I've got a C in maths and just straight <laughs> that. Uh, I, I hope the idea of it, but it's really for the QSs and for the, uh, the, the mathematicians out there. It's a very it's a formula. formula. It's a formula. It's, it's 60 yeah. pages yeah. of formula. Um, that basically you run through that formula to work out what the price will be. And there are, are numerous variables within the formula that arrive at that calculation. I cannot see anybody, I mean, this is a trend at the moment. We're only seeing a little bit of pressure for fluctuation clauses. I can't see us moving to everybody demanding fluctuation clause C straight away. I can't see it getting there. Mm -hmm. And frankly, everybody's going to have to read it and understand it before they even start asking for it. But option A, option B, I can see that pressure building up. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let you off. I'll let you talk. That's, That's very kind of you, Chris. It's first time you've been kind to yeah. <laughs> Um, So I think in summary, really, what effectively you're saying is that in order to manage the current supply chain and inflation risk, the mm. clients are best advised to do four things. And by all means, jump in here if you haven't missed anything out. You're saying consider the risks early. That's yeah. the common sense approach. Um, the second thing is obviously to appoint a really good professional team, including a project manager and a lawyer yes. who can identify inflation in supply chain specific risks specific to your project yeah. and, and then help you with mitigation strategies. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is this um, enlightened and collaborative approach that you've talked a lot yeah. about. Um, and then finally, make sure that whatever the contractual mechanisms that you do agree and adopt, allocate responsibility to the risk that you identify and they actually work in practice. Yeah, I yeah. Um, I think the one that I didn't really cover off when we were discussing this subject mm -hmm. was the need for a good PM, good project manager, to steer that procurement process at the outset. Mm -hmm. they, if, if they are familiar with the, the kind of work that you want to do um, and, and the nature of your project, then they will be able to save you a lot of time and money in the, in the long run. Yeah. It's important to get the right guys on board guys or girls on board yeah. um, and I think actually having a really good professional team is something that runs runs through sort of the whole theme of today really and I know that Marcus we're going to talk about that and, 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 and in relation to the defects position so um, thank you and very much it's a really um, helpful Pleasure. overview okay. of the key risk really the market's facing at the moment and how in practice we're, we're, we're trying to help and deal with those and and push project forward because as you say everyone can do things built on both sides it's just a question of coming to some kind of collaborative approach to get to get keep the wheels turning um <coughs> marcus we're talking about defects today yeah. um with your um as a contentious lawyer um defects of course are a major source of disputes on construction projects um we're looking at arguments as to whether it's something a defect in the first place and the requirement for a contractor to rectify defects, what a latent defect actually is, um, is there a duty to warn about defects in other parties' work, a whole range of issues really um, that rear their ugly heads in relation to defects on construction projects. Um, understand that today you're going to focus on defects related issues in relation to JCT DMB contracts. I think it's important to point out to everyone that there are obviously 
huge number of different um, construction suites um, oh, available in yeah. the market. NEC, we've got Fidditch, um, usually used on international contracts, obviously. Um, can you just briefly explain the reason for the focus today on JCT DMB? Yes, two reasons. Uh, the first is, as Ian mentioned, it's the contract that we see the most often, yeah. uh, certain yeah. JCT suites. And the second reason is really to simplify the purposes of today's discussion, because mm -hmm. under the design and build contract, the liability for design lies with the contractor. Yeah. So there's no need to have to separate a defect that's been caused um, by, de uh, by design mm. and, and workmanship. So the liability is there there in one place. Yeah, sure. And I think just going back to the basics as well for a second, um, most people will know that there's no common or universal definition of a defect, which makes your life obviously more complicated from the get-go. But um, for everyone's benefit, can you briefly explain sort of what a defect actually is, what we're looking at? Yes. So somebody calls or emails me with some horrendous pictures of cracks or something like that, and then says to me, Marcus, I've got a defect. Yeah. So one of the first things I'm, I'm looking at is, is well, how does that fall within within um, the, the contract, within the obligation? So a defect can usually be described as an element of design um, or construction, which falls short of what should have been supplied. Yeah. So in terms of um, a defect being express, um, a breach of express term, uh, it might be a failure to use anything uh, specified by the employer's requirements, mm -hmm. a use of materials prohibited by the employer's requirements, uh, workmanship or design not in accordance with the contract and then outside of the express terms you might look at implied terms so a breach of supply of goods and services act mm. something like that sure and um i think defects are something that people uh, commonly associate with post completion so your defect specification period um but actually that can be a little bit misleading i think and um it is something that needs to be thought about and discussed um in the between um, client and professional team at um, during the construction phase itself. Um, is that something you've got views on, on, on sort of dealing with, is it easier to deal with them early on and nip it the bar before we get to defects rectification period? Is that it, it is. practical experience? And it, it is, and it feeds into what Ian was saying about getting your professional team uh, lined up from the outset, really. And mm. the reason why you can instruct the contractor to open up. Now, who's best place to instruct the contractor to do that? Somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. And that's going to be a well-appointed um, uh, and properly appointed contract administrator or employer's agent. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned cost because an employer's agent um, typically charges somewhere um, somewhere between 5-10% of the contract value um, for their fees. Um, and often parties will look at that and say, well, that's a fee I can save yeah. or at least reduce by reducing the scope of what they're employed to do. Yeah. But really what you want is a well-appointed um, contract administrator who's there to inspect regularly, to inspect for quality and positive, positive obligations to inspect for quality, as well as being involved in, in valuation with your, with your quantity surveyor. Um, and look at it's not for me to criticise the way that people run contracts, um, but we do see that. We yeah. do see yeah. uh, employers' agents with very limited scopes, and then, uh, unfortunately, things do slip through the net, and they can manifest themselves later down the line, sometimes years down the line, yeah. when it becomes all a lot more complicated. Yeah. Maybe the contract is insolvent by that point. Yeah. Um, so if you've got somebody on board um, who, who, as I say, is dealing with and instructing the contractor to open up, to look for defects as, as the works are being mm. progressed and it, it, oh, the problem. it is yeah. and it can really it can really affect yeah so i mean effectively what you're saying is that defects are something we should be thinking about not only from npc but also during the lifespan of the project itself um i think it's quite important to look at pc itself before we move on to talk about defects and um, rectification for this the 12 month period following pc and um, because uh um getting pc in the first place there are sort of things that you need to think about around defect at that stage as well, aren't there? Yes, and often people are uh, perhaps quite fairly desperate to get to yeah. PC because the yeah. contractor uh, doesn't want to be paying any, any delay damages, um, an employer wants the use of their building, um, but it's important just to take a look at, um, a look at PC. Um, it's not a defined term in the JCT yeah. suite of contracts, and it's a question of fact. So if you'll forgive me for just referring to a court judgment here, uh, which discussed um, for PC to, uh, to occur, that the employer is able to take possession of the works and use them as intended, but not completion down to the last detail, however trivial and un unimportant. Mm. So what does that mean? It means practical completion can be given where there are minor defects that can be, uh, that then can be dealt with at a later stage. But 
what it doesn't mean is that you can get PC where there are incomplete works. Mm -hmm. and, and I do want to draw that distinction because there are there, there does seem to be some confusion out there that yeah. essentially you can say, well, the works aren't complete, but what is not complete is quite minor. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can uh, practical completion could occur. Yeah. It can't. If you've got minor defective works, um, then yes, you may be able to uh, have practical completion, but not if there are works that simply um, are not are not done. Mm -hmm. And so we get our PC, the corks are popped, everyone is delighted, and then we move into our defects rectification period, typically a period of 12 months now. This liability situation in your defects period of 12 months, and um, that is not a one-stop shop for liability, and I think you'll go on to make that clear, you know, it's not, that's not a one bite of the cherry to get everything right, we have got limitation periods. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about the interplay really between general liability and limitation periods and what we've got in your defect rectification period. Yes. So as you say, the defect rectification period, I mean, you'll have discussed that with Ian when you've been yeah. negotiating the contract, but 12 months is, is very typical, but yeah. I have seen shorter periods. Uh, and the, the liability point that you raise is important because I have had uh, situations where parties have understood that uh, liability lasts as long as the defect rectification mm -hmm. period, so say 12 months, um, but that's not right. Mm -hmm. um, the liability will be six years if you've signed uh, if you've signed it as a simple contract underhand. If you've executed the building contract uh, and did your appointments um, as a deed, then the liability period will be, will be 12 years. Mm. What the defect rectification period dictates is the relationship between the parties during yeah. that period. So for any defects that appear within that period, it's for you as the employer to say to the contractor, I have identified this defect, and it's for the contractor to remedy, repair that defect yeah. um, in a reasonable period of time and at no cost to you, um, you the employer. And it's important because um, what you'll want to do, ideally from an employer perspective, is be, um, if, if the contractor does, does not carry out that, that repair, then it's only at that point you can instruct a third party to, to, yeah. to do it you've got to give the contractor that opportunity if the contractor fails to do it or refuses to do it then you can instruct a third party to do it and, and, and if you're incurring some with a third party ideally what you want to do is be then uh deducting that sum from the final account mm. or retention mm. um or you may end up chasing the sum as it were as a debt but you really yeah. want to be doing it uh reducing it from money you've already got control over yeah. rather than trying to recover or something. Yeah. And then you've drawn this distinction with liability in the 12 month actual defect rectification period and your limitation periods under the actual contract. I think another distinction that um, it's quite important to, to draw here is between latent and patent defects. Latent defects being an inherent defect, something that's understood in the, in the, in the general market, but maybe um, um, it's quite, it is something that people struggle to get their heads around. Can you just shed a bit more light on what we're actually talking about when we're looking at latent defects? So a latent defect is, um, it means a defect or a, uh, an imperfection that it's there, but it's not visible. We don't know about it. Right. Um, and it's not reasonably discoverable at handover. Mm. It's probably something within the core of the building or hidden behind um, some decorative element. And typically, a latent defect will be discovered or manifest itself um, later down the line. So, to give you an example of how we often find latent defects, if you've got a water leak, it yeah. requires some sort of intrusive investigation, some layer of plasterboard to be removed. Yeah. You will often find, for example, that uh, fire stopping um, or insulation um, has either been fitted poorly mm. or, in some cases, not at all. And it's that sort of defect that we you will identify yeah. because of the water leak that's caused you to, to remove some paneling. Um, now, moving on to sort of defences raised when we're looking at actual defect claims, and in my experience, we often see, I'm sure, um, in, in we're, we're seeing this as well, we often see contractors raise the defence that PC's yeah. been signed off, that's great by your contractor, um, your um, contract administrator, or your employer's agent. Um, the defect was not disputed at PC. So, what? Why is there? An, why is there an issue now? Is that something you commonly see, and is it something that worries you? We do often see it as a defence raised by a contractor. They say, as, as you say, well, building control signed it off. Yeah. Your employer's agent signed it off, um, or they signed off the period of work, whatever it may be. They gave full valuation for it. Um, 
it's a pretty uh, sort of low hanging fruit argument to deal with. Mm. Um, I'm not usually too concerned um, when, when, when it appears. Mm. If, if a defect is there, then a defect is there. That's not one to give you particular sleepless nights. Um, obviously, non detection is not the only string in the contractor's bow in terms of its defects armory. What, what, what does give you a, a sleepless night? What, uh, where, where are we worrying again? What does concern me a bit more? Um, often um, repair and maintenance. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say you've got uh, lifts that are defective in some way, um, then, then um, it's really important when a contractor raises uh, maintenance and repair to be able to say, oh, and what they're basically saying is the defect has arisen because you have not looked after the building that I've built for you properly. Yeah. Follow the OLM then, man. Follow yeah. the OM manual that you will have been given a PC. When I say when we say follow it, don't just chuck it in a drawer or leave it hidden on a hard drive that then gets corrupted. Use it. Be proactive about your building maintenance and keep a log of what you've done. And this is particularly important where you've got a portfolio of yeah. buildings because sometimes you end up with a situation of um, the owner of that portfolio has a bit of a one-size-fits-all approach to repair and maintenance. Mm. And what we want is bespoke maintenance. Um, so that we can show to the contractor very readily, yes, we maintain the building, and here is my log to demonstrate mm. that. Sure, now I know that Ian didn't want to talk about fluctuation options, <laughs> but I was mean and I made him talk about them anyway. So, and I know that you're not going to want to talk about the Leaves and Damage Act, um, which is obviously drawing legislation into today's discussion, but I think it is quite pertinent that we do just touch on it today, especially um, given the legislative developments we've had this year in relation to the Builder Safety Act. Um, and sort of interaction or the interplay between those two pieces of legislation. Um, can you just give us a, a brief summary, really, of how, how that interplay works in terms of liability periods? Yes, so the Latent Damage Act effectively extends the period that you might have to bring a claim, um, and it gives you the right to bring a damages claim within three years of the date of knowledge of material facts concerning damage and the right to bring action in respect of that damage, and it's subject to a 15-year long stop date. Now, the reason it's quite a complex area of law, it very often requires expert evidence. Um, and that's because what you're looking for is for somebody to give an opinion on a date when a negligent act took place. And you're often talking about a negligent act from years and years ago. Um, and that's why it gets quite, uh, quite complicated. Yeah. But as you say, it's really pertinent. The Building Safety Act of this year has, in certain circumstances, extended the liability period to 30 yeah. years yeah. Um, and we're already seeing uh, claims um, and considering position for clients to bring claims um, with that extended yeah. long stop period. So if, if there is a defect and someone brings a claim, a successful claim, I think um, the damages position uh, that, that people would expect is actually slightly different in practice. Um, can you just give us an idea of what, you know, what kind of monetary compensation if that's even the right word to be looking for what is it what, what can you expect in, in, in relation to a successful defects claim so assuming we've got over the liability hurdle the sum of money you'll be seeking is the sum of money to put you in the position that you would have been had the contract been properly performed so it's forward looking um if you've got defective glazing for example it's not the damages you will be seeking. It's not a refund. It's not looking at what the glazing cost you in the first place. Mm. Um, and we've heard Ian talk about inflation. So that's important. It's what it's going to cost you now or in a year's time, which yeah. might be substantially more. So it, it, exactly. That could create a, a, a certain element of a contractor going in and actually agreeing to go in and repair as opposed to fight the claim. Yes, it will be yeah, nice. yes, it will be because the contractor won't have a margin to worry about the original contractor in that sense. Mm -hmm. So it's forward looking. So the mm -hmm. cost you'd be looking for in that example would be um, the cost of repairing, re um, replacing, replacing mm -hmm. that glazing. And uh, uh, do I as an employer, I mean, there's an obligation to mitigate those those losses? Uh, yes, you, you do have to mitigate your losses mm -hmm. um, and the court can, can uh, reduce your damages if you haven't. And a really straightforward example of that would be something like a water leak, because if you've got a water leak from somewhere in the building, it's very likely that if it's not uh, remedied quickly, yeah. that it will go on to cause further damage to other parts of the building. Mm -hmm. So in that case, what you want to do is carry out a prompt repair and, and also uh, to get in touch with the person that you think is responsible for that defect and mm -hmm. say, this is what has happened. This is what I've done about it. I've done that in order to mitigate my loss. 
and, and, and now I seek you know, a resolution. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to slightly put you on the spot now. Um, what does an ideal an ideal defects claim look like when it comes to a desk? What are you looking for? What do you want from a client? What, where's the perfect package of information in this fairy tale world that Ian wants to live in? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. well, if I'm going to join Ian in that fairy tale world, but from a contentious side. <laughs> Um, then, then I hope you'll forgive me for referring to another construction practitioner who once said that a party to a dispute will learn three lessons, often too late. The importance of records, the importance of records, and the importance of records. True. So what I, what, what I really want to see is a whole stack of paperwork, um, thousands of files for me to look through. Um, and, and I do have to emphasize uh, that, in, that in my experience, that, that has been entirely correct. I've had clients that have said to me, Marcus, uh, there's a, I want to bring a claim for a breach of contract. I want to bring a claim for a breach of a collateral warranty. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, great. Let's take a look at these contracts and the collateral warranty. And they've said to me, oh, well, I don't have the contract <laughs> and I don't have the collateral warranty, but I'm confident this is what it said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in those cases, it might not actually be a showstopper in terms of bringing a claim because it may well be an implied term, but you really are, that really is a secondary position. Uh, and another important point is cost yeah. um, in that respect, because um, where you haven't got files and records, I really will be going hard looking for them. Yeah. And it does bring back a pretty painful memory for me of spending three days in a windowless room um, at the storage facility on behalf of a client of an insolvent contractor yeah. where we were looking for contract documents. It was yeah. me, three paralegals, three days, windowless room, trying to find documents. Now look, on that occasion, we found we found virtually everything we were looking for, and, and we actually got a really good result for the client. But it was significant expense um, incurred just just in that exercise. Mm. Now, there's some good news for you, which is that we're actually running um, very tight on time now, and also because you answered the latest managers' ask questions so nicely, I'm not going to make you talk about adjudication today, and um, we can save that for another time. That's very kind. Um, but I think um, before we type and take some questions, I think the um, it would be really helpful for everyone um, if you could just give us your five top tips on feeding the defects claims, so bringing together everything you've talked about today and just, you know, in, in, in one place, so your five top tips. My five top tips and really going through the life of a, of a building project would be to say carry out early due diligence and mm. um, be very alive if you're working with a contractor who's carrying out work on the land that they've purchased and perhaps you're entering into some sort of joint venture with them look very carefully at the environmental and ground condition reports about the condition of the land and who uh, they owe liability to mm. you want to be talking to ian about that at the outset um, and not me mm. for two three years down the line um, Retain control over your, your consultants and your subcontractors. Again, talk to Ian about collateral warranties. Make sure that those appointments are, are well drafted and that they're tight and, and executed as a deed to benefit from the 12 year limitation period. Uh, the third thing, uh, going back to what I said earlier, consider a contract administrator and have them appointed um, with the scope of works to include inspecting for quality. It will give you another avenue yeah. um, in case you've got an insolvent contractor, you may look, be able to look to the employer's agent. If uh, you're, you've got a defect and you're still in the period of negotiating the final account, try to have a final account that, that takes account of that sum that you think might be involved in the defect. That might be a bit optimistic, but I would try and do it yeah. if you can. To repeat what I said a moment ago, records, records, records. Please keep them. Please retain them in some way, um, and do do use them and use the contract during the life of the of, of the of the construction, the build phase. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'll forgive me for giving a sixth one because we didn't get to talk about adjudication. We are tight on time. I would just I'm say sure. I would just say on the adjudication, it's a very fast moving process. Yeah. Um, it's twenty eight days in short. So, and it's no defense to say I wasn't ready for the adjudication and the adjudication decision will be binding on you. Mm -hmm. So if you think you are at risk of an adjudication, talk to, to, to me, ideally, um, you get your ducks in a row early because it's really fast. That's lovely. Very succinct, um, good summary of putting everything together that we've talked about today. Now, I am conscious that we're tight on time, but we have had a few um, questions through. So. We'll do our best just to answer and um, uh, take a few questions and then obviously if there's anything further you'd like to discuss please do contact um, marcus or ian directly they'll be more than happy to talk about um, anything they've discussed today in further detail with you